and, and world-renowned specialist in neuropharmacology. He worked uh, uh, lots of time uh, and, and he has more than 700 published papers in this field of neurodegeneration of models, functional models. And uh, we are very happy to have uh, Professor Jenner in our uh, neurology summer school. And um, Professor Jenner will talk about multimodal drugs for a multimodal disease. Please, we're looking forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think it was a slide before that. Yeah. These days you have to show um, you have to show all these disclosures because you sometimes get money from pharmaceutical companies. And what this actually should say, Peter Jenner, Emeritus Professor of Pharmacology. And what I have to explain to you is emeritus means you still work for the university but nobody pays you. Okay? <laughs> so you have to take that into uh, into account. And I showed you the title already, but this is a strange title, I agree. So it may not be immediately clear what it means, but what this is, is a man coming up to me and adjusting my microphone. Is that okay? Okay, that's better. Even I can hear me better now. So, so what this is, this is an excuse to show some pharmacology in relevant to Parkinson's disease, because it's very important that when you use drugs in Parkinson's disease, you understand how those drugs are effective. And so you should be able really to sit back and just look at a bit of pharmacology during this talk. But don't sit back too much because Professor Morisano asked me for five questions to go into the final examination. So you'll have to pay some attention to the pharmacology. And this is what I'm going to do. These are very simple objectives. What I'm going to do is I just want to point out something that you probably all know, and that is the complexity of the pathology and biochemistry of Parkinson's disease. Then I want to point out why we keep using some of the older drugs to treat Parkinson's disease in various forms, as you've as you just heard from uh, Professor Antonini. And then I want to explore this concept of using drugs that have more than one action to treat Parkinson's disease because of the nature of the illness. So if we, if we start at this point, you, you should all know this. And you should know that the pathology of Parkinson's disease is not limited to the basal ganglia. The pathology of Parkinson's disease is exceptionally widespread. The more you look for pathology in the brain, the more you find, and many brainstem nuclei uh, degenerate. If you look in the basal ganglia, then taking dopamine out of the basal ganglia isn't the only thing that happens. Once you remove that dopamine, what you do is you alter all the neurotransmitter systems which control the striothalamocortical loop that gives you voluntary movement. And if you want to have a list of systems which are affected in Parkinson's disease, certainly this is a dopaminergic disorder, but you have to remember that noradrenergic, serotonergic, cholinergic, and glutamatergic neurons are all affected by the pathology of Parkinson's disease. So it's a very complex disorder. And that complexity is why you get both motor and non-motor symptoms, with many of the non-motor symptoms arising from pathological and biochemical change in areas outside of the basal ganglia. So the first thing to point out is that Parkinson's disease is a multimodal disease. There's no pattern to the pathology or to the biochemistry. It occurs in different ways in different people, but certainly this is a complex, progressive, neurodegenerative disease affecting many different brain regions. But you can use this complexity as an opportunity because what you should be able to do is then start to use drugs with non-dopaminergic actions. You should be able to move away from just using dopaminergic drugs and affecting motor function. You should be able to get at some of the non-motor symptoms. You should be able to use drugs which have more than one pharmacological effect to try and rectify more than one biochemical change with one medication. And what you should be getting is treatment of both motor and non-motor symptoms at the same time. And you also can probably do something else, and that is you could probably repurpose drugs which are used in other 
disorders in other disease categories and bring them into Parkinson's disease because of their pharmacological or biochemical effects. And I'll show you one example of that towards the end of uh, this presentation. Now, you'd think that's what we would do. But in fact, in the last 20 or 30 years, the philosophy for developing new drugs for Parkinson's disease has almost gone in completely in the opposite direction. And what largely happens in the pharmaceutical industry, I, I'm not sure how you, much you know about drug development, is that they, use, they like to use these processes called combinatorial chemistry, whereby they produce millions of template molecules, and high throughput screening against a single pharmacological or biochemical target. And the argument is you get highly focused drugs which have a single pharmacological effect, and in the case of Parkinson's disease, this is largely aimed at dopamine receptors, and what you can do is increase the receptor specificity and efficacy of drugs. That's the philosophy. The difficulty with all of this is what you're doing is you're having a way of treating Parkinson's disease that leads you into polypharmacy, because every time a new symptom of the disease comes up, you add in another drug to control that particular symptom. And once you go down the road of polypharmacy, what you're doing, of course, is increasing the risk of adverse events and drug interactions. And in fact, having followed this philosophy for a long time, uh, I'm afraid to say, particularly even with newer dopaminergic drugs, and having followed this philosophy for targeting drugs towards each of these neurotransmitter systems, what we found is that this has not been very successful. You will notice that there haven't been very many new drugs introduced for the treatment of Parkinson's disease, and some of the newer drugs which have been introduced don't seem to be as efficacious as the older drugs, and we've become very reliant on going back to some of the older drugs and trying to deliver them in novel ways. And this is the new philosophy that's now starting to arise. This realisation that some older drugs are more effective than newer single action drugs has made us start to question why these older drugs are so effective. What's special about them that we can't, gives us a position where we can't reproduce their effect in some of the newer molecules. And this applies certainly to some of the oral dopamine agonists uh, Rapinarol and Pramipexol are very useful drugs, but eventually patients on Rapinarol and Pramipexol will be switched to levodopa therapy. It certainly applies to apomorphine, as you've just heard from Angelo, and it also applies to uh, another old drug, uh, amantadine, which can be uh, a very useful molecule. So what I'm really going to do is I'm going to explore why these older drugs are so effective. Because if we understand why they're so effective, that will help us develop a new generation of treatment uh, for the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And I'm going to start with levodopa. Now, you might find it strange. You might find it strange that I'm going to point out that levodopa is metabolized to dopamine. That's fine. Of course, that's what everybody presumes levodopa does. But the thing I'd like to point out, first of all, is you have to remember there are five different types of dopamine receptors in the brain, which are grouped into two types, D1-like and D2-like receptors. And of course, dopamine is the natural neurotransmitter, and dopamine from levodopa interacts with all these different dopamine receptors. Now, why is that important? It's important because we know that if you stimulate D2 receptors in the brain, you get an anti-Parkinsonian response. If you stimulate D1 receptors in the brain, you get an anti-Parkinsonian response. But if you stimulate both D1 and D2 receptors at the same time, you get a greater anti-Parkinsonian response than you get by stimulating either D1 or D2 alone. So it's very important that levodopa gives you dopamine, which mimics the physiological effect of endogenous dopamine and all of these dopamine receptors. And all of these dopamine receptors are in the basal ganglia, and they all have a role in the control of movement. But this is the next bit in the story. You have to also understand that some of the dopamine formed from levodopa 
is metabolized by dopamine beta hydroxylase and produces noradrenaline. And of course, noradrenaline is deficient in the brain in Parkinson's disease because you lose the noradrenergic tracts during the degenerative process. In addition, levodopa goes into serotonergic neurons and it's metabolized to dopamine in serotonin neurons. What it does then is to displace serotonin and become uh, non-physiologically released from those serotonergic neurons itself. So the levodopa has an effect on both noradrenaline and 5-HT transmission, both of which are involved in motor function and both of which are abnormal in Parkinson's disease. Now add in another layer of complexity in this drug. There's this group in Japan who for 20 years have been telling us that levodopa, in fact, does not need to be decarboxylated to dopamine. Levodopa can act as a neuromodulator or neurotransmitter in its own right. And what they've identified are neurons in the brain which contain levodopa but have no decarboxylase activity, so there's no conversion to dopamine. And it could be that this is a drug which modulates brain neuronal function without decarboxylation, as well as giving rise to dopamine and affecting noradrenaline and 5-HT. And then this last bit of it. Levodopa has two components to its actions when you use it in Parkinson's disease. The first is the one that everybody knows, that after each single dose of levodopa, you get a therapeutic response in terms of improved motor function. And this is loosely related to plasma levodopa concentrations. But levodopa also has a long duration response. Now this is a response that builds up to the drug over the first two or three weeks of administration without you watering the dose. And it's a response that if you would be brave enough to take levodopa away, you would see that this long duration response also diminishes over a period of two or three weeks. Now, I'll immediately tell you that we can explain this, of course, because this is dopamine interacting with dopamine receptors. The long duration response, however, is completely unexplained, but it indicates that levodopa has a neuromodulatory effect of some kind with long-term consequences in terms of basal ganglia function. And if you put all of this together, what you realize is this is not levodopa going to dopamine controls Parkinson's disease. What you're dealing with is a complex multimodal drug that affects numerous different neurotransmitter systems. Dopamine, noradrenaline, 5-HT also affects glutamatergic function and may act as an amino acid modulator. And this might be why levodopa is a better drug than the oral dopamine agonists, which are highly restricted in terms of their pharmacological and biochemical actions. And this, these multiple actions might explain why it's the gold standard drug and why it's the drug which will eventually be required with, by every patient with Parkinson's disease. So let's, let's do the same exercise again. Angelo told you correctly that apomorphine is clearly the best dopamine agonist drug that we have. Although apomorphine cannot be given orally because it has no oral bioavailability. It's completely metabolized by first-pass metabolism as it goes through the gut into the liver, which is why you give it by subcutaneous injection and subcutaneous infusion. He illustrated very nicely that apomorphine is a drug which is highly effective as rescue therapy by single acute injection. It's highly effective when you give it by subcutaneous infusion and it can be as effective as duodopa and deep brain stimulation and also as effective against some non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So why is this dopamine agonist better than the other dopamine agonists? Well, the first thing is Everybody just says, apomorphine, a dopamine agonist, and I've just been saying exactly the same thing. And the reason we say this is that apomorphine is looked upon as being the archetypal dopamine agonist drug that everybody who does laboratory experiments in Parkinson's disease would use to produce 
all the usual motor behaviours that you can produce in rodents and primates. So this is the, the view of apomorphine uh, as a dopamine agonist. But here's some real pharmacology, and I'll make this easy for you. This is a whole range of receptors at which dopamine agonists can act. This is dopaminergic receptors, adrenergic receptors, and serotonergic receptors. Here we've got a comparison of apomorphine, pramipexol, and ripirol. Don't worry about these numbers, except that the bigger the number, the more potent the drug is at any particular receptor. But let's start looking at the dopaminergic profile of apomorphine. When you look at apomorphine, what you see is apomorphine, like dopamine itself, interacts with all the different subtypes of dopamine receptor, D1, D2, D3, D4, D5. If you come down and look at pramipexol and ropinirol, what you find is that their actions are restricted to what are called D2-like receptors. They have no effect at the D1-like receptor population. So apomorphine is much more like dopamine than the other dopamine agonists. And that, of course, again, is important because, as I pointed out, if you stimulate both D1 and D2 receptors, you get a better anti-Parkinsonian response than stimulating either D1 or D2 receptors separately. So let's go to the other side of the slide. If we start then to look at interactions with adrenergic and serotonergic receptors, and I'll make this easy for you, the answer is that apomorphine interacts with a wide range of adrenergic and serotonergic receptors. And if you look at ropinirol and pramipexol, you don't see that same broad spectrum interaction with these receptor subtypes. So in other words, apomorphine has a multiplicity of pharmacological effects and biochemical effects that you don't see with dopamine agonists which do not have the same efficacy. So, as a summary, you can say apomorphine interacts with all dopamine receptor subtypes. Apomorphine is not just a dopamine agonist. Apomorphine alters noradrenergic transmission. Apomorphine alters serotonergic transmission. Apomorphine is a multimodal drug in terms of its over, overall pharmacology. Let me do the same exercise again. This is safinamide. This is a drug which I'm, I'm told is not yet available in Romania, but is it available in other parts of the European Union. Safinamide has been introduced as a new potent selective and reversible inhibitor of MAOB. So that's fine. You think, well, okay, we already have rosagiline and selegiline, which are irreversible inhibitors of MAOB. So what is the interest in this compound as far as Parkinson's disease is concerned? The answer is that safinamide is not just an MAOB inhibitor. It also has a range of different pharmacological and biochemical uh, effects. And in fact, the most important of these is probably the fact that it is also a sodium channel blocking drug and it was first developed as a potential drug for the treatment uh, of epilepsy. So why would this additional sodium channel activity be important? And the answer lies here. It lies in trying to understand dyskinesia in Parkinson's disease. Now, we don't know too much about dyskinesia. We've got lots of lovely hypotheses, most of which are untrue. But what we do know about dyskinesia is that dyskinesia involves the overactivity of glutamatergic systems in the brain. So overactivity of the cortical striatal glutamatergic pathway, overactivity of the glutamatergic pathway coming out of the subthalamic nucleus. So how does this glutamatergic activity link to the sodium channel blocking properties of cefidamide. Well, the important component of this is that on the terminals of glutamatergic neurons, you have sodium channels which are involved in the release of glutamate. And what you find when you look at cefidamide is that certainly in vitro, this is a drug 
which is capable through its sodium channel blocking properties of, an inhi of inhibiting the release of glutamate. And more recently, in in vivo experiments, this is using uh, in vivo microdialysis of the basal ganglia in uh, rats, it's also been shown that in vivo, administering sulfidamide will decrease the release of glutamate, and this is probably due to the fact the drug is blocking sodium channels on the terminals of those glutamatergic fibres which are overactive in this uh, animal model. So, if that's true, if this is a drug which is not only an MAOB inhibitor, but has sodium channel blocking properties as well, do those sodium channel blocking properties result in a functional change in the action of this drug because of its complex pharmacology? And the answer is that if you go to the MPTP-treated primates, so this is an established model of Parkinson's disease, these animals uh, lose their nigrostratal pathway, they have profound motor deficits, and if you treat them repeatedly with levodopa, they develop dyskinesia, which is absolutely identical to dyskinesia that you see in patients with Parkinson's disease. If you give these animals levodopa, <coughs> Not surprisingly, you can reverse their motor deficits. If you give them levodopa plus sulfidamide, you get a bigger reversal of motor deficits than you get with levodopa alone. Now, this is completely compatible with the drug being an MAOB inhibitor because you get exactly the same response if you use rosagiline or selegiline. However, when you look at dyskinesia, the story is different. Give them levodopa, they express the involuntary movements, they get quite marked dyskinesia. If I was to give them selegiline or rosagiline at this point, I would be increasing the dopaminergic load in the brain, and what I would do would be to increase the intensity of that dyskinesia. However, with sulfidamide, what you do is in fact you get a decrease in the intensity of dyskinesia. And this is in all probability due to the fact the drug is blocking sodium channels or glutamatergic fibers, and what you're doing is switching off that overactive <laughs> glutamatergic system. So you can have the positive effects of this drug on motor function, coupled to a reduction in motor complications. So when you think about this drug, even though it's just put forward as an MAOB inhibitor, that clearly isn't true. Sophidamide is also a multimodal drug, you have to think about it blocking MAOB and affecting dopaminergic function, but this is a drug which also affects glutamatergic transmission in basal ganglia, and even if you move on beyond the MAOB and sodium channel blocking properties of the drug, it also possesses effects at calcium channels that can also have an effect on dopamine reuptake and other dopaminergic mechanisms directly. So this is also a, a, a complex drug. But the interesting thing about this is, because this is a drug with more than one pharmacological effect, it can do things other than simply affect motor function. And in uh, post hoc analyses of the clinical trials which have been used to show the ability of sulfinamide to treat wearing off, what they found is that if you look at things like pain, then sulfinamide has effects on pain in these studies. So if you start to pull out specific non-motor symptoms, the drug is also having effects here, and similar effects have been shown on mood and cognition. And what this shows is by having drugs with more than one pharmacological effect, you start to get actions on more than one symptom of Parkinson's disease using the same medication. One more example. Amantadine. Now, in my country, amantadine is used just to control dyskinesia in patients on levodopa therapy. In other countries, amantadine is very usefully used as first-line symptomatic treatment because it does have a, a modest symptomatic effect on motor function. Those of you who've tried to use amantadine will know that it can be very difficult in many patients owing to the onset of adverse events at doses which are necessary to control dyskinesia, doses between 200 and 400 uh, milligrams. 
The adverse effects are associated with peak plasma levels of amantadine after its uh, administration. So what can you do about this adverse event profile? Well, the answer is it seems very difficult because amantadine is, from a pharmacokinetic point of view, an almost perfect drug. It has great bioavailability, almost complete absorption, has a lovely long half-life, and you get stable plasma levels of the drug. However, quite recently, an extended release version of amantadine has been uh, brought out, called Gokovri, and this is a drug which is now registered in, in America for the treatment of dyskinesia in Parkinson's disease, and all that this does is it avoids peak drug levels, allowing you to get higher plasma levels of the drug, and improves the tolerab tolerability of the drug in quite a dramatic fashion. So why am I showing you all this data on amantadine? What's, what's the message from this? The message is that if you read this lovely review by Olivier Rascal, what you will find is a nice summary of what we know about amantadine. And that is, amantadine, which is always called a weak NMDA antagonist, where you see it in textbooks of neurology and articles on movement disorders, in fact, the effects of amantadine in the central nervous system are multiple, complex, and not fully understood. And this drug, it is a weak NMDA receptor antagonist, but it's also a muscarinic antagonist, it increases dop dopamine synthesis and release, it reduces dopamine reuptake, and it has other effects on dopaminergic function. This is another example of an old drug which is very useful in clinical practice, which is probably having its effects because it has more than one pharmacological and biochemical effect. This is another example of a great multimodal drug. I said that was the last example, but that was wrong. I'm going to throw one more in here. This is zonisabine, zonogram, which many of you will probably know from the epilepsy world. Now, in Japan, zonisamide has been extensively investigated for the treatment of Parkinson's disease, for the treatment of wearing off, for the control of dyskinesia, and it is now marketed in Japan for Parkinson's disease. So, what makes this drug interesting? The answer is, this is a drug that inhibits gamma transmission, it also inhibits sodium channels and calcium channels, it inhibits MAOB, and it has effects on dopamine synthesis and release. This is a fine example of a drug which has been repurposed for Parkinson's disease, which again is another example of a drug with multimodal activity that proving to be of significant benefit. And this is the message, really, that multimodal drugs are probably the way forward in Parkinson's disease. It's a disease that involves multiple changes in neurotransmitter systems. It involves multiple symptomatologies, which at the moment you have to treat individually as they arise. And highly targeted single action drugs lead to increased pill burden, a loss of compliance, an increased risk of adverse events and side effects. And what we're saying now is that really what you need are what we used to call dirty drugs. And all you do is change the terminology, and you don't say dirty drug, you say rich pharmacology. It's the sort of politics of pharmacology, how to make a drug sound different. And we need these drugs to treat multiple symptoms using a single therapeutic approach. And this is key. Dirty drugs, which we try to avoid, are when drugs have pharmacological or biochemical effects at therapeutic doses which are off target and affect systems that are not mainstream to the disease you're trying to treat. What we're doing is we're using drugs that have distinct pharmacolo pharmacological actions that complement each other in terms of efficacy or toler tolerability. And what we have to do is we have to make sure that these multimodal drugs have pharmacological actions that work together to control the symptomatology of the disease without causing unwanted side effects or drug interactions. And why do we think this is important? Well, we think it's important because if you have multimodal drugs, you can start tailoring them 